Welcome to the My Rules Are Better podcast. I'm Tom Barbelay. Today, I have the opportunity of talking with a gentleman who I first met, I'm embarrassed to say, 32 years ago, <laughs> Matthew Gibson. It's wonderful to have the chance to chat with you today. Thanks, Tom. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on the line with you. So for folks listening in, I, I can't imagine you role played prior to 32 years ago, but would you like to introduce your interests in role playing, how you got started and maybe up to the point that we met? Sure. Well, I'm I'm a bit older, so 32 years uh, puts me would only put me at uh, 21, and I uh, was role playing before then. I started back when Advanced D and D had just been released. You know, maybe a year before or something like that. And I heard about this game that was this fantasy role playing thing, and that there were all these different dice. And there was a guy at school in my brother's age group who was a DM. And I essentially collared him in the in the school corridor and begged him to let me play, even though I was too young, <laughs> right? Because it just it just sounded like what I wanted to do. And it's very interesting because I I uh, been hearing your other podcasts and you had a gentleman on uh, in episode ten and maybe also episode eleven. I'm not sure who's so much of his background was so similar to mine, mm. the, liter- the literature part of it, you know, coming from that Lord of the Rings and also Narnia background, books that were read to me, wanting to bring those images to life was a big force in role playing. I never ended up playing with that guy. We went out, we bought the books ourselves. Mm-hmm. And then there were kids in my age group who were playing it at school he had that story about he, he, he thought he'd tag along and he went to this room and there was way more people than he thought and there was a lot of noise going on. That was my experience. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's interesting to look back at um, the things that I loved about those initial experiences and to think about how how poor in general the GMing was and how poor the storytelling was and how poor our understanding of the rules was, but what an awesome time we had. Mm. All critically important and intertwined. Mm-hmm. So that's that was my introduction to it. When I met you, you had lost the religion of AD and D, <laughs> and I editorialized it, which I I think it was in the order of three plus hours worth. Of, I can't remember whether it was you and your brother or you and a friend of yours who I also played with as well. I suspect it was you and your brother initially. And to set this out to the listenership. My mother went to school with a woman who is my honorary aunt, who lives in this beautiful little bungalow, this little hobbit hole of a place in Adelaide. In South Street, Australia. Adelaide. Yes. yes. And it was just such an amazing, warming thing. And I still pay hard to it. I still go back when I'm in Adelaide to catch up with, uh, with Helen. And yeah, it's just such a wonderful, every experience I had there, even, you know, the politics and the philosophy and the constant arguing with your father, which was completely mm. fun and above board. But every memory that I have there is prefaced by the smells and the environment. And I also feel very strongly about your mother's house as well, because I went and played uh, RuneQuest at your mother's house, and certainly we maintain ornamental cats almost as an homage to uh, your <laughs> mother's house as well. So these experiences, but really the, the three plus hours of tag team between, I think, you and your brother explaining why RuneQuest was only the only religion that I should have and I should turn away from AD&D and any kind of principles from AD&D and absorb. Can you talk a little bit about how you picked up RuneQuest? It's interesting that you would. I, I was listening to the podcast and you excoriated me uh, and, and and fair enough, too. And you used the word religion. Uh, I think uh Definitely in my younger years, and plas- possibly classically for that age time, I glommed on to things very intensely, too intensely. I mean, I look back and I, I, I look back with embarrassment about, the, you know, the righteousness with which I did so many things, whether it was uh, a, a new role playing system or a new game or, or feminism. So I... I must apologize. Oh, no, not at all. No, no, it's a beautiful memory. It's a beautiful... Do not apologize. You have nothing to apologize about. Of of, (laughs) of our delivery and and how intense I could be. So, I mean, yes, uh, yeah, I saw eventually the shortcomings of D&D. And now, of course, in my older years, I've gone back to Mm D&D because I no longer see the shortcomings of any role-playing system. 
it's it's really just all about the group, its dynamics, and the desire to story tell. Mm. To some extent, I mean, there's there's sort of a minimum sort of number of rules you need depending on the group. I, at the moment, for example, we just this afternoon uh, played another session of D and D with uh, my son Finn and his two two of his female friends. Uh, there only, only three of them could make the session, but you know they they just use the D and D rules and it's all fine. Mm. And they just they kind of just take it for granted, right? I, I'm going to jump around here a little bit. I hope you and my li- the listeners can keep up with it. Play um, with us. I want I, I want to go back to something you said in one of your earlier programs, where you said the best games have simple rule systems. Mm-hmm. They're easy to learn and hard to master. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you said that, I thought, oh well, he's 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 certainly talking about some long-standing games. There, I mean, chess has a simple rule system. Mm-hmm. I guess some, if, some, if, I can, if I can, if as you have the benefit of having me in front of you, sort yeah. of virtually, let me say that I understand the capitalistic forces involved with rule systems and the need to republish and you know these kind of things to maintain the organs that exist within the market. But I am constantly frustrated at the need for extreme complexity to address something that could be very different if it was on a simpler rule system. So I guess when I say that, I'm actually making a slightly political statement as well, that I think too much of this thing has moved into a complexity which ultimately alienates a substantial portion potentially of the play population and also actually creates a degree of aggression and a wide variety of other like curious elements, which are kind of you know the darker elements perhaps of folks that spend too much time role-playing in the worst possible case scenarios. So there's a slight political element when I say that. I've got to frame my rules a bit and not about exploring what exists currently, but in motivating the listenership to consider what they as individuals could do with regards to potentially initially just house rules, but then actually moving forward to consider writing their own rules. And I think in that notion, the idea of simplicity you know, easy to learn but difficult to master is an idea that I wanted to have the listeners thinking about, whereas what we're talking about here is more associated with existing rule sets and these kind of things. But anyway, I I completely derailed you. Continue. That's fine. I I think I'm sure your listeners are used to uh, digressions. Very good. (laughs) So, for example, some of my favorite games are actually games with a lot of rules. Mm. They're, they're, They're like World in Flames, uh, advanced civilization. These are not small bo- rule booklets, and uh, I love the complexity of the rules and what it brings to the experience. When I use D and D with these new young players, rather than show them some other system, it's in part because all these books, which are very beautiful to look at, of course, they have lots of lovely artwork in them. That's part of the attraction. I, th- I wonder if the if the number of rule books and all the pages suggest to people new players that there's richness to be found in that complexity and that's that draws people in and i and i've tried to go back in thinking about this to my earliest experiences when i saw the books and i think although i can't be certain that that's part of what drew me into all those books Mm. all those books mean potential and richness and but i do agree with you that that is a that's ultimately a falsehood the richness comes from you, Mm -hmm. the GM, and they, the players, and the teamwork in building a story and a world. So, in my original question, can you talk... I I was fascinated. I know we can't go back 32 years. We can't Mm. revisit this. Oh, yes, RuneQuest. Okay, (laughs) so I'd gotten rid of of D&D, and and I'd falsely had this impression that if the game system was somehow better, the experience would be better. Mm. Now, RuneQuest has an interesting setting, and I agree with your other guest, the Ducks, what? No, I never used them. But um, I think it was actually a guy called Ben, Ben Gronin, who was was with us at the time, mm. but it might have been my friend Simon Miles. We both, we all played RuneQuest. We moved away from D&D briefly. Mm-hmm. I didn't end up playing RuneQuest for that long a time. You probably found me oh, in just that little, little niche. <laughs> you know, in part because I moved on from role-playing games because life changed, mm. right? Uh, and, you know, I really haven't played any role-playing games in, in decades since because I've moved around and worked and then a family. And, and now that Finn's at the right age, he got interested. And I was like, yeah, I'd love to get back into it for sure. Let's do D and D. Yeah. There was, I was enamored for a while in different systems. And again, with that thing that 
maybe here will be more richness that I'm looking for in the storytelling. And ultimately, that's not really what it gives, though, of course. Mm. There's another game I play. I, I bought a lot of. I bought a lot of, Tom, a lot of, and I never played it once. And it's called Ars Magica. Oh, okay. And it's a really interesting system, and it's a really interesting milieu. And really, that's what I enjoyed. I just, I, I just read the supplements. I read everything, and it was great. <laughs> I read all the, the the bits of different parts of Europe. This is it's kind of set in a uh, historical Europe, and it has the same thing as the the the, the kind of uh, Harry Potter thing, where magic is there, but it's it's hidden from view because for everyone to see it would be we we, we create a nutso situation, mm-hmm. right? So the, the the mages have all this power, but they can't use it in a public view because of either the church or the state or the people freaking out. The system is great and it's very poetic. And so I just enjoyed reading all the materials. And then really in the end, it was, it was like reading novels that had no particular storyline, but my own imagination. Hmm. I mean, certainly that resonates very heavily with me as I look around at my bookshelves, that uh, a vast majority of these games I have never played, but mm-hmm. it's the same point. <laughs> Chris Abbott is a gentleman that you refer to, and he actually lives very close to you. You're actually probably neighbours, embarrassingly so. He lives in Windsor, Ontario. I'm not sure where you are, but in a, a similar... I mean, I think of that area as being... So. About three and a half hours away. Yes, I know, but, you know, close uh, to so yeah, I mean, no, it's southern Ontario, right? Certainly, yes. In any case, so we are about to talk about miniatures, and that's another topic that I wanted to raise with you, because another thing that I picked up from you was a miniature which I carried around for a number of years until it basically disintegrated, I think, because of the quality of the alloys that it was cast with. But I found a gentleman in, I think it's North Carolina or Virginia, who still makes the exactly the same miniature. So I had to get one to you to return to this thing. How I'm much? Right, and I appreciate it. It's, and he makes his 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 sculpts are great, and I love that one. I always love the character mm. of that particular and his. Because when you said you're going to send me a, a miniature, I was like, oh, I, I was trying to remember which one it was. And, you know, I was going through all these things. And, and then I opened it and was like, yes, that beautiful ogre. <laughs> so much character so, in that guy. So can you is, talk, yeah. were miniatures part of it as well for you? Or can you talk a little bit about miniatures? Well, it's interesting about miniatures. You know, when I uh, was growing up, all the miniatures that existed were either the were, were, were military mm. rather than fantasy gaming. They were all... Uh, and my brother and I had lots and lots of uh, you know, German and Allied soldier miniatures. Um, so they were originally lead, and mm-hmm. then they we were able to get cheaper plastic ones, and we played a lot with these miniatures, right? Uh, and but here's the weird thing: is we got into role playing, and there was never any connection we made between using miniatures and role playing. Uh, I, I again, I'm trying to think back, and I imagine that the idea of using figurines would have seemed maybe anathema to me, mm-hmm. to the spirit of role-playing, which is all supposed to happen in the head. Mm-hmm. With this, yes, you have a map that you use, and that's the one little bit of visual ID you have, but everything else is supposed to be talked about and thought about. And but at some point, I did decide to bring in mini- miniatures, but we never used them that much. I kind of got them, and, and they were beautiful, and we used them sometimes. But it's not like today where uh, the newest systems of Dungeons & Dragons are constructed around having this, having a map and having figurines to help play it out. And the rules uh, have built in systems for, of correspondence. Mm-hmm. You know, how all the, all the spells work in terms of, you know, these squares on a, on a piece of paper, which never really happened before. You know, in the, not in the original D&D, there was no sense of how they might translate onto a physical map. That's interesting because I have the chainmail rules, which predate D&D. And you're right that there is a distinction, but I think certainly our experience, I don't know, I mean, how much of our experience was shared associated with Australia, but miniatures from my recollection in Australia were incredibly expensive in contrast to a lot of other things. Yes. And that created a strange kind of economy and certainly the same places that you, the, the, the same dens of iniquity that you'd get your role playing game rules would occasionally have little blisters of miniatures. Certainly by the mm-hmm. time I was doing this in the, you know, mid to late eighties. But I do recall that there were keen distinctions based purely on costs. I had a, a school friend who unfortunately I've 
unfortunately is no longer a friend, who was born in the UK and whose parents and, you know, family members would get him, you know, White Dwarf magazines and a number of the <laughs> British publications that had miniatures. And, you know, so my early visuals are very much on if only we could get these things so we could play with them as well. And certainly we did bulk orders. We went into the bank and did the, you know, the money order and all that experience and, you know, waited six to probably yeah. 12 weeks <laughs> and then got this box and then divided them up if you were still friends with all the kids. And, you know, there were all these kind of experiences which were pretty central. And I think when I got to the UK, I was, as you are, it, it, as you described, not really very interested in these games anymore. But within a year... I'd stumbled into a local news agent and just thought, oh, I can probably buy a white dwarf. It'll probably be okay. And then almost immediately were corresponding with sculptors and folks from my childhood. It was very curious how quickly I'd kind of picked up the miniature thing very much in a kind of created community and contacted, you know, local artists and a variety of folks because they were all regional to me. It was all very curious to be in the environment that had actually birthed this thing. And to have some quality time and a bit of money and, you know, these things may change my experience, but very much associated with finding the folks who were, you know, in their late teens, early 20s, in the mid 80s, who had created a lot of this you know, art and sculpting and what have you. But actually, miniatures in Australia were a very few and far between thing. And I do wonder, certainly reading more associated with the history and, you know, Guy Gax's own playing of Chainmail and things like this. I wonder if it's a creation of Australian gaming, per se. There are pictures of figures, or there are at least sketches in certain, you know, um, you know, secondary publications. So, yeah, I don't know how much of that is just Australia. But when I found that ogre, it was one of I, the first maybe three or four, you know, miniatures that I ever owned. I have a dragon, actually, which I still have to this day. He lost his tail, but I still maintain his <laughs> broken tail that was purchased at a similar time period. But the ogre kind of carried on with me until it, it disintegrated. In fact, it was one of the few miniatures that I carried on with me because it kind of perfectly represents everything that I like in, in fantasy. Kind of strange, haggard, clearly mm -hmm. gnarled, clearly far too many battles, uh, but <laughs> at the same point, you know, kind of monstrous, curious creature. But so I guess... For me, miniatures are inextricably connected with this thing, but I do recall certainly probably the first five, six years I played as a boy, you would get, you know, there was no way you could have the D&D &D experience now where, you know, characters are represented, monsters are represented. They're almost like little amulets, <laughs> miniatures mm -hmm. at the time, that kind of came and went and were, you know, lauded upon and stared at, but incredibly expensive in contrast even to the game rules, because the game rules came from the US predominantly, whereas the miniatures came from the UK and Australia, and the, the cost was Yeah, I had to do the same thing that uh, that you did. We we ordered in a big big batch of miniatures, <laughs> and so they were they were handpicked essentially because of we liked that individual sculpt. Mm. There was no... I mean, we, we were thinking to get into Warhammer mm -hmm. miniatures. Uh, uh, that, that fell apart by the time the miniatures actually arrived. But they were just all, there was no like, I'm going to build a particular army or I really need this because I'm going to run a campaign where the players fight a beholder. It was just like, I like this sculpt. I'm buying this one. Mm. You know, so I got in maybe in the end, like 50 different sculpts. And that was, that was one of them. That was, and, and one of my favorites for sure. And did you go through, I mean, certainly talking with Chris Abbott, he has a loss period, although it's a relatively recent loss period. Did you go through a period where you discarded a lot of the stuff, or do you still have a lot of your original stuff? Well, I had I moved to to, uh, to Canada from Australia. I I arrived with a backpack, everything everything I had, right? Mm -hmm. And while lots lots of stuff was in the storage back in Australia for many years, and subsequent trips, I would unload more and more of it. But essentially, that's what I did. I had I guess gave everything away. I didn't sell it. I gave it away. Mm -hmm. And certainly. You know, you, you talk about um, paring down rule systems and making your own. Uh, it's almost like Monk, not so much as a character <laughs> class, but as a as an approach to gaming, so, the zen of, uh, of a role-playing system. Uh, maybe the challenge is, can you get it down to a single rule? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you can get it down to no rules, actually. 
Sure. I mean, I think the thing that interests me, which is why I wanted to talk to you, we've, we've kind of done the niceties of leading up to this point, is associated with narrative. And mm-hmm. it's associated with, in some regard, cognitive dissonance, but really just associated with narrative and associated with vision and storytelling and all these elements which are you know, never actively discussed. You might see it in a, in a DM guide here or there. But just associated with what role-playing means in terms of, certainly from my experience, I started role-playing when I was, you know, I knew you when I was nine. So mm-hmm. relatively young age, just a world of possibilities, an ability to explore political systems, economic systems, a wide variety of different things that would never normally, you know, a child of that age would ever be exposed to. And I think that, for me, led to computer simulation. It led to where I am professionally now. It led to so many different aspects of my life because it created a sense of hope and possibility. And I think that is the thing that fascinates me associated with all these different systems is that what's rarely talked about is actually the quality of the folks who are participating and the storytelling and, you know, rich points of analysis that they can bring to what is ultimately eh, sometimes relatively basic problem solving, but still trying to explore something with words and ideas and imagination. And that, to me, I find very interesting. And when I started this podcast, it was purely to cultivate that experience in other folk, to inspire other folk who have, you know, had similar experiences associated perhaps with how they pick these rule systems up. But as you have done, you kind of wandered through life and returned to them. And I think a, a no rule <laughs> role playing game environment, really the just playing cast rule set was originally that the addition of meat and rules was mainly to make my coworkers more sympathetic to spending a, you know, an evening every couple of weeks um, in my presence. But I think most of it is associated with narrative. It's associated with a wide variety of ideas, and the rules are incidental in some regard. They are, but they also provide an, an interesting framework because I think every most people come to the table with – not everyone who's at the table is going to have the same priorities mm-hmm. and the same experience that they're hoping to get from the session or from the long-term campaign. And, you know, there are people who are more storytellers and there are people who are looking more for a gaming experience, uh, more like, you know, the, uh, the, the board game, but writ- much larger and more complex. And because it's ultimately a social occasion where you're hoping to have fun with people you like and bump up against their personalities, I think a rule system helps to give everyone a place they can try and hang together and achieve different not just different um, in-game goals, but different personal goals. I've returned to listening to podcasts that are associated with tournament war games, mm. predominantly Warhammer 40,000. And unfortunately, Games Workshop has kind of alienated, well, the, the, their fantasy offering has changed. I used to listen to the Square-based fantasy podcasts as well, not because I was a player of either system, but because it gave me, it's like the, the furthest realm of psychology, right? It gave me the the rawest opportunity to understand a different kind of player. And certainly when I arrived in this country in 2005, I was adopted by an uh, expat Brit who was very big in the local Warhammer 40,000 tournament scene, but also he had similar connections to people in Games Workshop, so he kind of took me under his wing. And I went to see him and his friends play, um, both in his house and also at a local game store. And I realized these aren't my people. Mm. <laughs> they, the rules, as you say, it is very much rule. The rules are the defining setting in this thing. They are playing basically chess with dice, but moreover, there is a, an aggression, almost a hostility, which I felt kind of a bit alienated from, but I still am interested in this thought process. I'm still interested because it fascinates me that this is a, an organ that has maintained now for 40 odd years. I'm hoping to have lunch with Ian Livingston and Steve Jackson, and they both are polymaths in a wide variety of different directions. But the notion that they created this company, which has existed now for more than 40 years and has produced tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands potentially of people that are interested in 
you know, fantasy worlds, be they science fiction or, you know, regular fantasy. But within that psychology, a good number of them are probably an antithesis of the kinds of folk that I would normally describe to certainly folks I'd play with, because they are enacting wars and rules and competitive, very militaristic in some regard. But that whole organ as a thing has always fascinated me, if nothing more from a simulation standpoint. So I do see what you're saying. I see on one extreme there are the super, you know, rules-oriented, very mechanistic in some regard, but basically agreed upon so these folks come together and, you know, run their orcs and marines indefinitely. But I think, yeah, there is an interesting, there's a kind of multidimensional nature of this thing, and I see them on one uh, extreme. But I'm certainly interested in those folk. I think just in terms of how they kind of continue to be nurtured through this thing, and it's, you know, multi-generational now as well. So mm. it is very interesting to see the various aspects of this kind of expanding thing that was perhaps seeded by Gygax, perhaps was seeded by folks in Germany, you know, a hundred years prior to that, wherever it was seeded, has at least expanded into this broader uh, set of interests. So what's the next step for you in gaming, do you think? Well, I've been running a local game with my workmates, initially, as you're doing with your son, 5th edition D&D, which brought forward all my... Thanks to the indoctrination, the religious indoctrination I received from some individual who now <laughs> denies his religion back 32 years ago. So, yeah, I, I saw uh, D&D play itself out. It was fascinating, actually, the psychology of my co-workers. I mean, more than anything, that was really fascinating to have in incidental players that came in and had very had never played before, but had very particular play styles. And the ability of acting and also exploring just divergent ideas was wonderful through that. Then we returned to the Just Plain Chaos rule set, which is based on, you want to talk historically, writing that I wrote when I was 16, 17. I mean, it's based on novellas that I wrote back then, a post-apocalyptic environment of the actually mid to late 90s kind of continued on with some strange Australian political elements in it as well. So the fact that that's sustaining my co-workers and I have a farmhouse and a bunch of other stuff there, the goal is they have to fight their way out of a city and end up in a farm. So I've already built the farmhouse and that's ready for the conclusion of that. On a personal level, I've always had an interest in strange geopolitical things. And certainly the last kind of hurrah of my misspent youth was when my mother moved to Malaysia and I went to Malaysia periodically and started reading the New Strait Times and it was the time of the first Chechen Wars. So I have a fascination and um, communicating with a, a company that makes figures for the first Chechen wars. And I think a character-based first Chechen war like theme game is a fascinating ability to explore some of the elements that I was exploring through just playing cards. And I'm going to write the rule set through this podcast, talk about the various points of the rule set. But having received those figures initially, they are characterful figures. It's mm-hmm. the the guy is writing a a, a multi squad you know, probably a Warhammer 40,000, but based in <laughs> Chechnya game for it. From my experience, holding the figures in my hand, I think each of these figures has a story to tell, and I would almost take it back to a, a role-playing with wargaming elements part to it. So I'm doing a lot of reading currently. I have historically read about the first Chechen Wars, but I'm doing a lot of reading currently, and I've watched a few documentaries recently, and I think just the setting of that thing is so poorly understood but it is really a turning point associated with all the kind of continued narrative of the war on terror. I mean, obviously the Boston bombing folk came from Chechnya, but the history of Chechnya has fascinated me for a long period of time. So my own gaming, it will be creating, um, it will be circus-like in some regard. I mean, you can't really explore anything to too look much detail because the Chechen war, the first Chechen war was just such a small period of time. And the Chechen state now is just a police state. I mean, in terms of any every possible uh, expression of what occurred in the first Chechen Wars, it's just completely been repressed now. Second Chechen Wars were more a circus associated with the war on terror. Um, obviously, Baslan and the uh, Moscow theater siege, you know, just really horrible events. So that I'm going to explore in the short term, just in narrative form for this. I also want to return to, I talked a little bit with Chris associated with which were rules I was writing at the time when I first met you the Britannia rule set which were 
I think from 600 to about mm, 1000 AD, very UK centered, but a lot of the kind of druidic stuff I've discovered on Netflix, The Last Kingdom, which is a show set in that period of time. And I want to return to that period of time. And I, I expect, I hope somewhere that I have at least a subset of the Britannia rules. And I want to rewrite those for this podcast as well. But yeah. as you've stated, a lot of this stuff is really a personal project. And the ability to share this in audio form is built on, as you know now, many years of podcast recording as well. Mm. So I think the ability to share this, I, uh, more than a decade ago, restarted a podcast with a fellow who's still going on with this podcast. And because I gave a negative review of a book at the time, I was kicked off the podcast rather splendidly. So I have about a decade worth of pent-up energy to talk about here as well. But I think certainly for me, it's taking some of the ideas of simulation, uh, which I've done for 20 plus years now, and just explaining them in very new to some people, but certainly very old from my experience as a way of taking a period of time or an idea or what have you and creating a game around it you, that you can then share with others. So I think I've probably mm. given you the next year's worth of tinkering. I really do want to move through the Chechen stuff probably within the next six months and just get that down and see if I can play test that at work. It's even more esoteric than just playing chaos. And because it actually deals with real world things, um, but it's kind of creating a role playing setting around it. It's going to be an interesting one. And similarly within my gaming group at work, uh, at least one of them has watched Last Kingdom. So I think I can move them into the, you know, <laughs> Wessex kind of, you know, <laughs> experience relatively seamlessly as well. It also will be a pitched battle kind of game. So it will be where they will control maybe, you know, a faction, a person basically, but you'll have, you know, at least six factions that will come and meet. And it's a different style. I mean, what I'm trying to do here is it introduced my co-workers to a series of ideas that I have only really been exposed to through my own reading. I mean, my role-playing stopped pretty well. I continued to role-play with a few people up until I was about 17, but really I went through a period when I was about 13, 14, where I just became disgusted with a lot of the kind of organized things. Too many men who were actually now yet far younger, than me, but too many men in their you know, early 30s, kind of unkempt, sweaty, smelly individuals that just went around kind of terrorizing kids. I just thought this wasn't a thing for me at the time. So, yeah, to me now it's about reintroducing, as you say, a breadth of reading to a group of co-workers, but also to try to, when you come to a country and you know this intimately, you come with a different set of ideas and certainly your move to Canada are probably slightly closer to Australian philosophy than my move to the US. Uh, you want to introduce people to this idea that you have, in the time that you've been alive, you have a different set of experiences. And this set of experiences can be represented in a wide variety of things. The narrative part of just playing chaos is very much to introduce militarism, repression, a wide variety of ideas that aren't really part of a general American narrative. So... Mm. That I think is, uh, you know, part of this as well. You've asked some deep questions here, Matthew. <laughs> the, it, it's interesting that you, you're looking at the Chechen war because you, you're in a country where it might be very hard to get an audience for that conflict. A lot of people wouldn't even know about it. Without question. Um, a lot of people wouldn't. And if they did, may have certain prejudices against caring about the outcome for either side. Yes. No, that's, uh, I, I, that's very curious. And that's why I'd actually want to run with it for all those reasons, because I think it's a fascinating. So is it almost that, that this system is in part for you to explore that conflict because it interests you on one level and another thing that it's like, it's like you're the filmmaker who wants to <laughs> help people to understand there was this amazing thing that happened and it was important and you, there's a reason you should care and this is your way to get them because you're not a filmmaker you're a, you're a, you're many things but <laughs> this is your this is your movie certainly hmm. I understand that you need to leave shortly, Matthew. It's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you. Let this not be the last conversation that we have. It shall not be. It will not be the last time. Because it's been wonderful to catch up with you. And uh, 
you know, we can formalize this into actual topics going forward as well, potentially. But I think you've introduced sure. yourself perfectly and you've also asked some really insightful questions. So thank you very much. It's been wonderful to have the chance to chat with you today. It's been my pleasure as well, Tom. Take care.